Welcome to King County Connects, a program where we connect you with the important issues in our region. I'm Enrique Cerna. It started with the New York Times story of Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein's abuse of women. The hashtag MeToo campaign exploded on social media as a vehicle for women and men to share their stories of sexual harassment and assault. Now Time Magazine is naming the silence breakers in this movement the 2017 People of the Year. They are people brave enough to come forward with harassment claims that are toppling the careers of the powerful. The Me Too moment is also being felt here locally. Joining me now to talk about it is Council Member Jean Cole Wells and Mary Ellen Stone, Executive Director of the King County Sexual Assault Resource Center. Welcome, good to have you here. Thank well, let's you. talk about the Time Magazine article. Uh, to me, that seems like it's such a significant thing to have happen, particularly in the midst of all of yeah. this. Uh, Mary Ellen, I would think that when you saw that, you had to say, whoa. I, I think I actually said that. Because, <laughs> um, uh, because it, you know, this movement has been certainly rolling forward both in um, intensity and in duration, much longer than I would have guessed. I don't know about you, but I, I figured this would stop sooner than it has. And then to see that validation, and that recognition that things really are starting to change, I find it very encouraging. And you, how about you? Jean? Well, it's been, the question has been posed, is it a moment yeah. Yeah. or is it a movement? Uh, as a sociologist by training, uh, I think time will have to tell. I remember other moments that turned into movements and then they kind of dissipated. Uh, a lot of them having to do with sex discrimination and mm -hmm. sexual harassment. Uh, we can look back over the years. Um, the Year of the Woman in 1992 came from the Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill hearings. And uh, the next year there was uh, record elections, including Patty Murray. Uh, but things change and then they roll back a little bit and we've visited this issue before. Will it have a lasting effect? I hope so. Yeah. And I think it has the potential to do that, especially with social media. It does, yes, yeah. especially with social media right. because I, you know, I wake up in the morning with my iPhone. I have it set usually to NPR <laughs> to listen to uh, the morning edition. But it seems like I get these alerts uh, that I have from AP or Washington Post at three or four in the morning. And lately it's been of some revelation. You know, Matt Lauer. Yeah. to, uh, you know, Gar Garrison Keillor, to, uh, you know, now who knows what will happen with Al Franken. Uh, but this, it seems like every day something has been coming out here. So I don't know if it is a moment or a movement, but it is definitely something that's happening and strongly. Yeah. In the New York Times article, you know, about the Time Magazine uh, award for the person of the year, uh, a comment was made, I think, by the producer, someone at time, that this is a social change happening so fast. Right. Well, social change takes a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Social movements take longer, but it still has caught the attention. And, and the other part of the of the person of the year was for the global conversation, mm -hmm. and I think that's a key part. It's not happening in Washington, D.C. alone or in the state of Washington or in, in the media, broadcasting world. It's happening in Europe and other parts of the world, too. Yeah, and I think that also is probably the, uh, the impact of social media in doing that. Um, right, right. Let's talk about your organization. Mm -hmm. As this has been happening, what have you noticed? Yeah, good question. We've seen uh, in the last four weeks, our calls, we have a 24-hour resource line that's staffed by trained therapists, um, and we've seen our calls increase 25% over the same time last year. So pretty steady. I think the first week of Me Too, they spiked up to 40% increase, and now it's sort of leveling out at 25%, 26%. Um, and we're hearing so when we go back and look, so who's calling is, is it mostly around Me Too? Not really. People are referencing Me Too. A number of callers have said Me Too has made me 
want to call um, and to reach out for some help because I was assaulted as a child. But I think the bigger piece is that it's, it's helping to create that climate that says it's okay to come forward regardless. So we've always responded to the full range of victims from adults who are assaulted as kids to child victims to adult rape victims to people who are harassed and other in workplaces. We respond to that whole piece it's that whole piece coming forward still, sort of at a higher level. So I, I find that encouraging. I, um, I, you know, I, and I guess I wanted to tag on to what you were saying too, Jean, of is this a movement or a moment? I, you're the sociologist <laughs> here, not me. What, what I think we collectively have got to grapple with is what do we, how do we hold perpetrators accountable? I mean, I, at some point, I'm believing that the high-profile departures will stop, mm -hmm. I'm assuming. I mean, I don't know if we'll run out of them, but that, that's going to stop. Yeah. But then what do we do with people? And I don't, I don't have a particularly good answer on that, but I think we as a, as a community need to figure out when someone has assaulted a person 15, 20 years ago, do we do, what do we do with that? Right, how do we answer um, how that? How do we answer that? Does that mean that they're um, not fit for certain kinds of positions of trust and responsibility, but they can do other things? So I think that that is a very, uh, it's, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Council member and sociologist, so <laughs> what do you think? Well, I, I think the real change now, and I think it, that we have to look at the context of, of it all, but the the real, really significant change is people are coming out publicly, mm -hmm. where before that was not so much the case. And there was more of a distrust of, of having your life just torn apart if you were to come out publicly. And now we're seeing people coming out publicly, not just publicly about an abuser from their childhood or whatever, but public personas, the president of the United States even. And that is a huge change. Uh, then secondly, we have to look at what happens. So people come out, and they, you know, they've been doing that against public figures, you know, back Bill Clinton we right. think of, uh, uh, George H. Walker Bush now, but you know, there's just a lot more of this being percolating around that's bubbling over. But what's gonna happen? How will we know Will we recognize when there's been real progress and real change? I mean, I, I mentioned back to 1991 with Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill and right. women being elected. In fact, from 1992 to 2000, 1992 to 2004, Washington had the most number of women in the legislature of any state in the country for a 12-year period. It's dropped off a bit since then, uh, but we recognize people do that when they're stirred to action. When the norms change, that's when you can really have lasting effects. And we have to see, will the norms change sufficiently or will this be mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. stabilizes, levels out? And right. I, I think we have to see. Mary Ellen, uh, mainly women that are calling? Mainly women, but about 20% of all the victims who come forward to our organization are men or boys. So that we see as a real improvement over even five years ago. I mean, talk about norms changing, um, more men being able to come forward, more boys identifying this, because we know boys are assaulted at about the same rate as girls. We just don't talk about that piece of it. So when I look through our stats for the last couple of weeks, nothing stood out as, you know, boy, that's a real anomaly from what we typically see. So it is mostly women, but we are continuing to see men, and I hope we see more men because we know they're out there. So I call, and I tell you my story, or I say, you know, right. this has happened to me. Right. What do you tell me? We help. We're going to sort through for you. What do you want to do? We're going to talk about how you're feeling. What kind of supports do you have? Is this um, is this something that you want to involve other people with? Do you want to make a report to law enforcement, criminal justice? If it's a child, obviously we have to do that. But for adults, we're going to give that, put that out as an option. Here's what to expect. 
because um, oftentimes people don't know what most, no one knows what to expect out of something like that. We may also talk about how, how do you think this is impacting you? We have very specialized therapy programs that work, um, absolutely proven to work, that help victims deal with trauma, with post-traumatic stress disorder, with other um, really debilitating symptoms that people have as a result of sexual assault. So that call to us is the is really sort of an open door to say First step. how do we how do we help? And uh, some t people just want to call once, and maybe they're going to call back because it, maybe it's the first time they've told anybody, um, which I think is particularly poignant when you hear when we hear from people who are 50, 60, 70 years old, and they haven't told anybody before, mm -hmm. and they're calling us. Um, but it, it's also a way to say, okay, we can still help. We can still do some things. You can still regain your life back. And then from there. From there, we're we're going to be we're going to help people connect into whatever resources we have available that are going to be helpful, or if there are other resources as well. Right. It's a starting yeah. point. It's a way to get right. the conversation going and to right. open up if that's what you right. want to do. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And what's important to us is that the victim re remains in control of this whole process as much as possible. So the person, the caller, is going to be the one setting the pace, and the caller is going to be the one to say, here's who, what, what I want to do, here's what I don't want to do, I don't want to be able to have to tell these people. We did a whole thing recently on Me Too and Thanksgiving, and how does this all work? I mean, you've been out there, and all of a sudden you're at the Thanksgiving table, and what do you do if you haven't told family members? I mean, is this the time to do it? We would say probably not, but you might want to have some support people. Um, what about if somebody who has been an abuser in your past is also at the table? How do you deal with that? So a lot of it is helping people cope with all of these intersections that they're dealing with. That's a lot. That's just, yeah. just a lot. Yeah. Um, you spent many years, Jean, in, in the legislature, mm -hmm. uh, and news reports came out recently about some of the things that have been happening mm -hmm. in the state legislature. Uh, uh, and some legislators who uh, acted badly. Yeah. Is, is, do you see after that has come out that there is now going to be some focus in how to deal with the culture in the legislature? Because it's not just you know, the fact that they're there making laws. You got lobbyists that you're dealing with, they got parties you're going to, yeah. these types of things. Mm -hmm. So it opens the door. Well, I can say a lot about that. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Uh, indeed, and it's really timely that this is all happening. It was 25 years ago in 1992 in January, and I was appointed to the House of Representatives to replace Larry Phillips, mm -hmm. who went to the county council. And um, I just arrived, uh, and there uh, was a sexual harassment training in the Senate on that first Thursday, that first week, and the House had an ethics training. But what was really amazing was a couple of weeks later, the Tacoma News Tribune came out with the headline story about sexual harassment in the House of Representatives, in the legislature. Right. It was just amazing. And um, so I'd had some level of involvement in a professional way in this, so I approached then Speaker Joe King that I might be able to be of help. And I got a hold of the sexual harassment policy, which I remember is a very lengthy sentence. <laughs> sentence. <laughs> One sentence. That was it. And That's it, now we look back at it, and it was the, what I was given to me now is, was four paragraphs long. Really inadequate, <laughs> to say the least. And, and I. There just were horrible stories. So I worked with a group that the speaker appointed, and we came up with a pretty good policy and procedures and training and all of that. And uh, we set up a, situa a system where some of us were uh, individuals people could come to. And a woman came to me who was an intern. This was early in the session. She was an intern. And she had been at one of the receptions, and one of our legislators went up to her and took her name tag off, took his name tag, tag off, name tag off, and put it on her nipples oh. through her clothes, and made a reference to pasties. And she came to us, and she left. 
Mm -hmm. She gave up her internship, wow. her college internship. There are all sorts of stories. It was like summer camp, you know, for adults being away from home. Bad the norms the changed yeah. governing the situation. So I embarked on a lot of legislation over many years that we got in place. And yet 25 years later, 20 years later, 10 years later, five years later, after different uh, pieces of legislation were enacted, here we are. So the, the situation's changed a bit. People are more aware, they're more willing to put their name out there, and yet some of the same things are happening. Comes back to what you said yeah. about how do you make the stick? Right, and it is, I mean, it, you know, we, we often use the seatbelt analogy, which I think is not adequate at all, but it's still how do you get people to start changing behavior in a way that's good for them. So it is a combination of laws, but it's also a combination of, a, and, and, and sort of some structural improvements, but, it's, but we, what we have not been able to do, I don't think, is really do some educational sort of resetting of norms. I think about prevention programs in general. So prevention programs that look at sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, child abuse, that whole gamut of interpersonal violence things, they are abysmally funded. I mean, absolutely abysmally funded. And it's not, it's a complicated approach, so that makes it even a little bit harder to sell when we're looking for funding, but there just is not enough support for this and so we fall back on this well we should do a one-time presentation to uh, high school kids about consent and saying no completely inadequate so we can we can get the laws in place and and thank you for your early work and and I know we're going to continue to improve on that but we've got to have we've got to be getting much more work with kids and with parents and we start making the changes that way as well to say Here's how, here's, here's what it means to be a man. Here's how you have a healthy relationship. I mean, we, we can't simply rely on the law. So I think that that's going to be the bigger piece. And that's, and, and now we're talking about a generational change. Right. But, but what's interesting, Enrique, is I was saying these same things 22 years ago, 18 years ago, 15 years ago. And we say yes, we put you know, the legislature, or a business, you know, for the workplace, whatever it is, our colleges, our universities. We just had laws go through two years ago that Barbara Bailey and I worked on. And they say yes, but then time goes by a little bit and mm -hmm. the moment gets lost, wow. yeah. you know, and then people take for granted. So yes, we need more money for training like in our colleges and universities uh, where young people are coming in and getting raped. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, we need to have uh, a very clear process so that people understand if they do have, if they have had something happen, they know what the process is to go through. Well, those are pretty much there. But there has to be enforcement too, plus right. this right. prevention right. program. I mean, Title IX, was enacted in 1992, and in, I'm sorry, 1972, and in 1980, the, uh, uh, an appeals court, U.S. appeals court, ruled that sexual harassment was a form of sex discrimination in Alexander versus Yale. And so that's been around for a long time. Now, unfortunately, it's not always carried out. And Enrique, I have to say, I've been an expert witness in about 10 lawsuits against school districts. The laws are there, the policies are there, the procedures are there, yet a teacher or a coach or someone uh, starts um, abusing a young student and nothing is done. So the impact so of trying to do something about it. It's really uh, critical. And how about the county? What, what is, you're, you know, you were in the legislature, or you worked to try to do things. What is happening in King County and King County government? So, ironically, uh, we had a meeting of our Committee of the Whole uh, today, and uh, 
we had a report on employee hiring under using our equity and social justice lens and how, you know, retention and all of that. And I asked the question about sexual harassment. Is that something that uh, seems to be an issue when people decide not to stay, you know? And they don't have the figures. They're going to look into mm. that. But I think that the county has very good policy and procedures, but they're now pledging to train all, I think it's 40,000 employees in King County by the end of 2018. Our council chair, council member Joe McDermott, has initiated a, a new approach where we will make sure that all of our legislative employees and members too will have training and we're in the process of setting that up. And it, we need to keep doing it. It can't be a one-time thing. What is happening to try to reach out to those underserved communities, particularly communities of color? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Culturally, in some respects, it's it's accepted. You may not be, you may not like that fact, but it's been part right. of the norm. Right. Right. Well, I, we're very lucky here in King County because there's some very strong organizations that um, are in and from those communities. I think about groups like the Refugee Women's Alliance, API Chaya. Um, there is a number of organizations working in the East African communities. Consejo is another strong mental health. All of our services are in English and Spanish, so we're fully bilingual, bicultural as a, as a sexual assault organization. It, it's, so, so those organizations are there. We're reaching out, and I mean, as part of this larger, how do you change, how do you change attitudes? I want to get back to something you were saying because I was I was reminded of this earlier in the week. When we think about the changes that we're, we're wanting to make around sexual assault, sexual harassment, sex discrimination, women's role in our in our society, mm -hmm. I, mean, I think about other social change movements that have really taken off. I mean, from my perspective, pretty quickly, um, the LGBTQ effort has has really sort of moved those individuals and those those concerns into mainstream and there's backlash mm -hmm. going on and and so I wonder from your perspective because you have worked at this at so many different levels I mean do, I, I could make an argument that we're in that same place of women's issues um, so I'm saying that broadly because that includes all the sexual violence and domestic violence that we experience um, have been slowly moving forward. We have big moments like this. There will be backlash. We know that that sets us back, but it moves us forward at the same time. I mean, it, I, so I that's sort of what keeps yeah, me I, going I think every so day. Too. What do you think? Any major social change has done that. I mean, we yeah. can look back at. Yeah. You know, the anti-war movement, the student right. protests, you know, the even health care. I mean, it's just, it's, it's part of the fabric of our society that we can take almost any policy area. But it doesn't move steady. Right, we, right. There we are hiccups, hiccups along, I mean, along the way, and I anticipate that will yeah. be happening here. But still, with social media and all the attention and the high-profile cases now, yeah. and with people, uh, everyday people who are not high-profile right. profile celebrities. You know, one thing that uh, I get to say personally, that it's, it's made me think about my own behavior mm -hmm. and about, okay, mm -hmm. I'm in the public a lot, yeah. but it also realized that, you know, how, how you handle yourself, but it has made me really think about that. But I'm curious, um, with, with you, we talked a bit about <coughs> parents and kids. What, are we, what is a parent? What's the responsibility there? And what do they do? And th that's where it starts. Right, right. And I think that there's a lot that parents can do. Um, you know, we, for a long time, have pioneered the importance of parents talking to their, their children about, you know, it's your body, you can say no, you can decide what, who touches you. I mean, some real basic building blocks. If something happens, let me know. Um, there, there are some really good tools out there for parents of younger kids. We also have a lot of tools for parents of teenagers talking about what, what does consent, I mean, we talk about consent, yeah. what does that look like? How do you give consent? How do you ask for consent in a relationship? I mean, these sound like basic things, 
And they are, but, but we sort of assume that somebody else is going to be talking with our kids about it. We have this one program called 100 Conversations. It's 100 ways, for, little conversation starters for parents on talking to their teens. We came up with this from a, a group of young people who said, I want to have these conversations with my parents, but we need to have it at least 100 times. That because one right. time, because one time is not going to do it, right. and so it is that. How do you raise? How do we raise our kids to be good, healthy, respectful young people and adults? And so that that's an ongoing effort from parents, but it's also then those of us who have kids in our lives, as well as the institutions that they work with, and public officials, the responsibility. Of well, public yeah. officials definitely. And um, that's been, that was one of the main issues that I dealt with in Olympia is not only are the norms changed when people go off to the legislative session, you know, and they, the norms may be different in their family lives, but uh, the sense of power and uh, that they have power. And we're seeing that playing out with a lot of what's going on now. But college professors, teachers, coaches, there can be the power differentials and they can be manifested in inappropriate conduct towards somebody who's in lesser power in that relationship. But certainly elected officials have to be held accountable. And even I, I mean, I, pretty aware of all these things and I work professionally on them, but um, I'm very uh, affectionate and I'm likely to go up to somebody, you know, and give them a hug or, you know, whatever. And, and I, as a woman, I have to step back just like you're thinking about mm -hmm. your own right. persona and And, and how can conduct. you take them, you know? And I've had a number mm -hmm. of men who are elected officials lately say that to me. Gosh, I'm really thinking about now what I have I good. done? I think, I think that's yeah, good. I think the lieutenant about it. governor, yeah. Yeah. in fact, mm -hmm. um, had been quoted saying that, yeah, he had to step back and think about, you know, that there was no malicious or right. anything right. aggressive. Right. No, you do, you do, I think you do, it makes yeah. you think. Yeah. And then if you're, uh, I suppose if, if uh, this is going to be just a, if it's going to be more than a moment and into a movement, that's yeah. the type of thing that probably has to happen. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I thank you very much for this conversation. Yeah. Um, not an easy one, but yeah. obviously one that's uh, critically important in our country today. And I think uh, with uh, the Time Magazine uh, uh, article and, and that focus there, it obviously is uh, making this uh, something that, that people are going to really have to think long and hard about. Yeah. We all do. All right. yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your time. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Mary Ellen Stone, Executive Director, King County Sexual Assault Resource Center, and uh, Council Member Jean Cole Wells. Thank you very much for your time. And thanks for joining us for this edition of King County Connects. Visit us online at kingcounty.gov, KCTV. We'll see you next time. I'm Enrique Serrano.